Peace. My name is Terrence Muhammad. Others know me as TC, but my legal name is Terrence Muhammad. Okay. Thank you, Terrence Muhammad, TC, for doing this interview. Today is October the 26th, 2020, and I am Tara Green at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. So I'm going to begin by asking you, where are you from? I am from Greensboro, North Carolina. I was raised in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina, born in the hospitals of Greensboro, North Carolina, raised in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina until I was 15. And then I moved to the city of Greensboro at the age of 15, where I graduated from Dudley High School and attended North Carolina a and So what are your earliest memories, um, either in Pleasantville or in Greensboro, what do you remember growing up? Well, in Pleasant Garden, um, as it relates, I guess, the context of this, I remember living in the country um, where we drank well water. Uh, my father raised chickens. We had vegetables on our trees, uh, not vegetable, we had fruits, you know, oranges, apples, plums. Um, and we lived in a predominantly black community. Uh, and we also, but we also knew those whites that lived around us, but so we, living in a black community. And I grew up third through the ninth grade going to a white school. Um, so I remember it was in the fifth or sixth grade. Somebody was coming across a word, it was all reading in the class. Somebody came up across where it was nigger at that time or Negro. And right before they got to that word, I remember saying, watch it now. And everybody laughed. And I think they kind of skipped over the word or something. Uh, but that's the first time I noticed anything outside of that. But growing up, you know, just life in the country. And then, of course, it changed when I came to the city, per se, uh, and went to an all-Black uh, school. And then it wasn't whites and Black. It was all-Black uh, in Dudley High School. And then just leaving there and going straight to A&T. So that, that, that was the change from that standpoint. So when did you become aware of racism? It seems like you were aware of it by um, saying, don't say that word. So what, do you remember a specific incident where you knew, okay, this is a racist incident that's happening? I think one of the things that happened, um, because you know, I always tell people I became quote unquote conscious in college. But like I said, in elementary school, I remember that incident. And I also remember um, that, you know, we lived in a country, so we had the knowledge of certain, you know, Ku Klux Klan, but, you know, not necessarily seeing them. Um, but it's funny because we used to watch uh, Dukes of Hazard, watch mm -hmm. Hee Haw, um, and not knowing what we was watching. Uh, but I do remember um, that the, uh, uh, a sister was dating a white guy uh, in high school. And I think he disrespected her or something like that. But at that point, everybody from the middle school, from the junior high school, Southeast junior high school to the high school were looking for this guy. And I remember telling one of our white friends, he said, you know, if you mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. And I, at that time, knew the understanding of, you know, us sticking together as black people. We was very clear. We had culture, we had dance, we had moves. Um, the difference, uh, but it wasn't like my cousin who was going at that time Northeast or Northwest High School in Greensboro, and he was saying that they were literally having race wars and fights at their school. Uh, so I never saw anything like that at my particular school that I can remember, but I remember hearing about their clashes at his high school. Okay, so rather than dealing with racism, it sounds like your focus was more on um, or the focus that was given to you was more on a black consciousness, a black identity. But and I, I really can't even say that because okay. I didn't know that I had a black identity and a black conscious. I wasn't aware of it. Mm -hmm. I just was aware that I grew up in the country. Uh, I did recognize and understand what I saw when I grew up, but there was a dynamic. The rich white folks live, because when we went to school was Southeast, which was near Forest Oaks, which was near white, rich white people. So we saw, I saw rich white people. Where I was in the country, we weren't rich, we was poor. 
the lighter skinned, brown skinned blacks was seen as middle class. Some of the people that I knew was in the middle class. So I recognize uh, the, the colorism or the, the dynamics in that, uh, but I really didn't fully understand it until, like I said, years later, but that was understood. It's almost like you knew where you were and you knew where they were. You knew what people you hung out with, you knew who, who they hung out with. So that was always their underlying distinction uh, whether you call it that or not at the time. Why did you decide to go from Dudley to a and Laziness. <laughs> Laziness. I mean, like literally. Um, I thought I wanted to go to, uh, uh, I think, Chapel Hill at one point. And when I was growing up, I wanted to fly a plane in the Air Force. Uh, I was in ROTC for a minute, didn't stay. Uh, I wanted to go after seeing so many commercials about DeVry University in Atlanta, but at no time did I apply for college at all. Um, no time did I prep. I did take my SATs, but I applied for North Carolina a and in July of 1989 and got accepted and went to orientation in August of 1989. And that was the best decision I ever made. I'm glad I didn't go to DeVry. I'm glad I didn't go to um, Chapel Hill. I don't know if I would have gotten in, but going to A&T shaped the rest of my life. Well, let's talk about that. How did going to A&T shape the rest of your life? You mentioned that there was a consciousness that you came into while you were at A&T. Would you, um, was there something, an event that triggered that? Yeah, it was, uh, I think, spring 1991. Um, so when I got to ANT, you know, I already knew about ANT. Everybody knew about ANT. Everybody from Dudley wanted to go to ANT's homecoming. So homecoming was a major thing. I remember going to a gym jam in 88 uh, or going and I remember going in spring 89 before I got to ANT, going to one of the parties. But it was a party in 91 uh, that I attended. And it was a brother that I knew I used to always see at the parties. He said, won't you come to this history club meeting? And I was like, okay. Didn't think nothing of it. The following Tuesday, I went to this club meeting called a history club meeting in Gibbs Hall, the history department. And it was a club of considered the Afrocentric conscious black brothers and sisters. And when I walked in, I learned for the first time about Kemet, Egypt. I learned about the Ankh. And it was saying all this stuff that I had never heard of before in my life, never was exposed to as a black person. I just was never exposed to it. But not only were they given consciousness, they was in the midst of fighting for mandatory black studies on campus. So while I was getting the information, it was actually engaging and doing actions on campus. And that, that day sparked a continuation of a lot more um, in my life. Okay. So what would you say would be your first um, activist experience? One of the first, I guess, activist experience that was, you know, um, was I think, you know, getting out information on campus about one, the history club, and we had forums. Uh, we would have forums on uh, Afro uh, spirituality, health, economics, um, we had uh, the Black Student Summit. Um, so that was one doing forums on campus, like the educational part, um, having a club meeting and then educating people about different things as relate to Kemet or Africa, uh, conscious people. My first book was uh, Professor Cambon at Bowie State, um, Black Student Guide to Positive Education. Uh, that, was the, that was my first book that I got. Um, and then I think the next one, Afrocentric Spirituality by Ron Neffer. But the other thing that I was exposed to was a program that we had called Dream Builders. Dream Builders was an after school program where we brought children from Morningside Homes to across the street. We brought them on campus and did tutorial or to the No Book Store across the street from ANT at that time on Market Street. Um, but we didn't just bring them on campus and do mentoring program, but we also engaged their parents. We also engaged their communities and we was active in a community of Morningside Homes. Uh, so that's when I actually got into the community by the way of Morningside Homes. Okay. 
And as you went through a and you continue to be involved in various kinds of things? Um, yeah, um, to the, in some sense detriment, because I never, I was just conscious, conscious, quote unquote, going to every rally, going to every protest, going to everything. Uh, 1992, we had a rally on campus with other college students, um, some from NC State. Um, coming on campus and marching uh, to over the Chancellor's House, took over the administration building in 1992, uh, fight for mandatory black studies. Uh, and at that time, my mentor, Irvin Brisbane, Irvin Lee Brisbane, uh, rest in peace, who passed in 99, he's the one that brought me into consciousness about um, community organizing and going in the community and doing work in the community. Uh, that activism led to working with other black colleges so um, we worked with the Black Student Union at that time with all of the 11 HBCUs at that time in North Carolina. We used to have monthly meetings. I became part of the student government, became part of the Senate. Later in 94, I was the chief of staff for Keith Bryan, the SGA president at that time. And then we started, he started a lecture series called uh, the Third Thursday Lecture Series, where we brought incredible speakers on campus, the Afrocentric speaking like Dale Jones, uh, Steve Coakley, uh, Renoko Rashidi, Ashwar Kwesi, um, that was on the circus, um, Dr. Ava Muhammad, uh, Juanetta Longworth, uh, and brought these speakers to campus every third Thursday using college funds uh, to bring them for their speaking, you know, speaking fee, housing and lodging. So we did that, we carried that on. So the History Club uh, concept was actually merged into not necessarily merge, but Keith brought, you know, you use varsity money to make sure we brought these speakers on campus and not just for the students, but it was open to the community as well. Okay, so what do you feel like you learned from your mentor about organizing? Well, he was the first person, I eventually joined the Nation of Islam. So there was a brother named Brother Eddie X that sold me my first final call newspaper. There was another mentor, uh, Dr. Ridgely used to sell t-shirts on campus. Uh, of conscious things. And so the History Club used to help him sell t-shirts on the corner of Bluefoot and Laurel. Then we used to sell t-shirts at football games. So we were doing entrepreneurship. Along with Keith Bryant, he was selling hats. But my mentor, Irvin Brisbane, um, he not only taught about you know the consciousness, he used to work at the no book store. We used to always have to read books. So to be conscious, you had to read a book. You just can't uh, pontificate. You literally had we was up on all the new books that was coming out, all the new stuff that was coming out. But we also was going to other uh, colleges to see what activities were going on there and help other students at their colleges. Um, but we also was going into the community, helping young people that was maybe dealing with police brutality at that time, dealing with young people to getting jobs, uh, helping doing job training. Um, so it was not about being conscious and letting your head get big, but it was about how do you apply this to everyday people in everybody's day-to-day um, -day life. So he is the reason that I'm um, an activist today. Irvin Brisbane is the reason why I'm an activist. The History Club is uh, the reason why I may have become conscious. Um, Eddie, uh, Eddie Muhammad, Irvin Brisbane, Dr. Bridget, they may be the reasons why I ended up joining the nation. But well, all of that came from North Carolina a and can you just sort of um, take us back to the 90s in general? Some of this is fitting in with some conversations, national mm -hmm. conversations that were taking place. So what were, what do you remember about the 90s? And I think it's, it's, it's especially important to think about how HBCUs were important because, the, you know, there was the Cosby show and, and different world and that kind of thing. And so people had a sort of consciousness around um, Black people being educated. So what, what do you remember about that? Why was that such an important decade maybe for Black people, especially young Black people? You know, it's funny that you even said it because you actually took my thoughts out when you said Cosby Show and you said a different world. Um, I don't, you know, I think some people know and some people may know and some people may not know the impact, the major impact of watching the Cosby Show, the major impact of watching a different world uh, and watching Bill Cosby wear the HBCUs on you know, sweatshirts or, or just seeing 
uh, when I used to watch in different world, I was like, wow, like how did they, you know, I was like, you know, kind of like, wow, they're showing, they playing the music that we listening to. They, they, they're, they're stepping like we, we're stepping. So that experience on a black college, was, it was exciting. It was fun. It was wonderful. It was a joy to be at. Um, homecoming was on the yard then. And so everybody from out of town would come on the yard just to experience that college HBCU feel. But also there was this thing in the 90s and it probably started in the 80s, but you know, in the 90s, there was just this outburst of consciousness. There was this outburst of black um, consciousness, you know, we was wearing the medallions, we were the red, black, and green. And then there was the consciousness of the music, you know, public enemy, poor righteous teachers, brand Nubians. So to see someone with the red, black, and green on was nothing shocking. To wear the big beads was nothing shocking. As we came out of the LL uh, Cool J with the big chains, so you had this 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 sense of consciousness that was going around um, not only to a and but the universities. And like I said, at that time, the black student government, we was working with the black students um, that were conscious and students in student government. But the other interesting thing when you bring that up, I remember some of the, the um, black leaders that we brought on campus, they were saying to us that we was one of the last of the many or few, not many, one of the last of the few universities that was bringing conscious speakers to campus. So probably mid nineties, as we closing out the nineties, there was a conscious and concerted effort to keep black consciousness and conscious men off campus. So like now we bring people on campus, but they're the big Hollywood names. You know, you bring the big Cornell West, the Al Sharptons that, you know, bring a big budget. But I was bringing folks in maybe for $3,000. And then it windowed down to a thousand. Um, but to bring them in for three thousand, to give them three thousand and pay their airfare and lodging, it was like wow. And we get to speak this consciousness, and we brought them on to bring. Um, they had to bring visual aid, so they brought visual documentation. They brought the research. Um, so, but they was letting me know that there's only a few colleges that are still doing that. So that let me know as I grew to know that there was a conscious effort to stamp out. Uh, as I grew in the nation, there was a conscious effort to, to remove Minister Farrakhan off college campuses after 95 and Million Man March. There was also a conscious effort to remove Black consciousness off of Black colleges. As we saw the shift in hip hop and music from conscious music to gangster rap to other things that the industry allowed to be, uh, we also saw uh, the degradation of the consciousness on our campus we saw a lot of black bookstores close. Uh, we had a no bookstore in Charlotte, we had a no bookstore in Greensboro, we had a no bookstore in Durham, all three are closed. We had the Black Magnificent Bookstore in Raleigh, closed. So there were no hubs uh, where black students of consciousness could go to to study, to read, um, which is sad because like I said in 1991, we was fighting for mandatory black studies where other white colleges were getting black studies departments, we were just fighting to have courses on college campus, which we fought hard to get, uh, which we ended up getting something, but not what we originally started out because students graduated in administration, waited for us to graduate or leave so they can let stuff calm down and water out. So have you, as you've mentioned several times, um, certainly Minister Farrakhan was quite influential during that period. Is that the time in which you became a member of the Nation of Islam? Yeah, I joined in 1995, but I kind of was around it in 1992, 93. Uh, like I said, one of my mentors, Urban Brisbane, was a member of the nation. Um, so, but he was more, I never look at him as the person who brought me into the mosque, but he helped me understand my church upbringing. He even helped me understand my, um, the conscious community as well as the nation. So he helped me understand that. So, you know, our teachings from the nation were never about come to the mosque. It was always been in the community. It's always been out in the streets, always been out with our people. So I had that coupled with all this corner of consciousness uh, and going into community um, that helped to, to guide me more so in the community. So I always tell people in the nation, out of the nation, 
I was an activist before I joined the nation. So my, my activism, so everybody knows, like I said, my name is Terrence Muhammad, but everybody knows TC. TC is a community activist. So TC, he can go in the church. Oh, that's TC. He's in the church. He's not TC, the nation of Islam. That's just TC. But you can see him at the mosque. You can see him at the masjid. You can see him wherever. You can see him organized with white people over um, uh, whatever, um, stopping death penalty or whatever, because I came in to this work as an activist. Um, and that that word activist you know, has different meanings now. Um, because one, like I said, back then we had to study. So even when we had forums on campus, we had to study the work. We had to do a, a, a rough drive or a run of show to go over it amongst our peers before we even presented it at a forum on campus. We had to make sure that it was correct in what we were showing. So we actually had to study. Even on campus, professors like, well, y'all all black and conscious and having these forums, how are your grades? The majority, or well, a lot of the History Club members were honor, uh, honor students. Uh, one sister, Nia Banks, who was the daughter of Dr. Ridgely, one of the dudes that sold shirts on campus, she was a chemical engineer and she actually graduated the top of the class, her class. She was a Delta and top of her class and in the History Club. She now went on to John Hopkins and now has a practice in plastic surgery. So, and I bring that up because sometimes People see activists as the rowdy, crazy folks ain't doing nothing. Um, but a lot of those are the ones that actually go on to be successful entrepreneurs or speakers or, you know, whatever in positions of leadership in the quote unquote elite world. But a lot of people started their groundwork as activists. So how do you define activists? Well, I think the, the role of activism is different now because, you know, where 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 are you active at? Because activism now, people can be social media activists, putting out content, putting out information. Um, some people can be digital activists, meaning that they're putting out digital content, you know, doing filming. Um, some people can be uh, an artist, you know, using their voice. Because um, Public Enemy called himself the CNN of the people, giving out the information, giving out the news. Um, you know, I, I think my activism is different. I came up different where I had to go door to door and I met people. I had conversation in people's homes. You know, I was in the housing projects and had joy going to housing project. But you got a lot of activism now that don't actually get on the street, but they do a lot of stuff on social media. So they put a lot of content on social media and they have now seen as an activist. Um, and then there's a lot of uprising. So we were in the streets before the uprising. There may be an uprising would we'll be in the street, but when there was no uprising, we was making sure that we was getting out communication. We was fighting for our children in the school system. We was fighting against um, young people getting banned in housing communities. Like a person can get kicked out of one housing project and banned from all other housing projects in the city. Uh, we was uh, fighting for homeless people that have ID. You know, um, so it was a lot of things that we were really fighting for the people. And we didn't have no digital media to, to tell our platform. We actually had to engage. We actually had to talk to people uh, to get the word out. Now, activism is just done differently. Um, and there's some organizations now that are more aware of what people went through. So there's a lot more conversation about self-care, taking care of yourself, taking care of your mental health. Um, there's also now more uh, people getting into organizations uh, and institutions so they can train new activists. But then there's also the nonprofit world of activism. Get a nonprofit, get a C3, and you can be an activist now. You got a building, you can put out a program, you can put out an agenda, uh, and you can go home on the weekends. Uh, there was no... Um, there was no weekend for our activism. There was no uh, cutting off at five o'clock for our activism. I came in where we would plan for a meeting, do the meeting, and then debrief after the meeting and have another meeting to discuss what we're gonna meet about the next day. <laughs> so, and that still flows today for some people. Uh, we're still always engaging, but it had nothing to do about what you saw on social media. Um, but I don't not what I'm seeing today because technology has changed. The, the ability to put out more information is faster. The reach more people is better. 
So when we see uprise in the major cities now, you see hundreds of thousands of people coming out, tens of thousands of people coming out, whether you may have a lecture hall of 100 people or 50 people that you were just talking to. Um, in some instances, I miss the intimacy to grow the activism, but also appreciate the median where we are reaching a lot more people uh, with technology. After you graduated from a and with a degree in? No degree, then maybe? finished, stayed okay. active so much that I actually left and just went to work. So but I just stayed, major? psychology. Okay. Yeah, it was psychology. But I stayed on campus, I worked on campus, I'm still connected to campus, still work with students way beyond me leaving, leaving campus. Um, but it was in psychology, but I never did do anything in psychology. Okay, well, maybe. Well, yeah. technically as a therapist or a psychologist in that field, mm -hmm. but psychology has always been used. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so what are, what has been your path? I know some of the work that you're doing now, but um, what has been your path in continuing the activism? So have there been specific organizations that you've been involved with? I'm, I'm just trying to get to that. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that happened that's very unique um, for Greensboro history so Irvin Brisbane was that catalyst. He was that voice, that strong voice. And so before his past and the transition, there was the racial equity, um, or racial justice. I forgot what we called it, but Irvin Brisbane and some other folks was a part of that, was fighting a lot around school, on um, the school board and uh, redistricting um, and even the educational gap. When he left us, because uh, I, I still um, don't just see natural causes. But when he left, that group of us kind of disbanded in some sense. And there was really no real focal group like in the community. Uh, some people try to pick up the mantle, but no one could pick up his mantle. So it was a, a period of void for me. Um, seemingly like who was out there, like the folks that was with him, uh, like why y'all not out here in the same streets that he was in? and arguing it was just it was just no voice but the beloved community center was here with reverend johnson and joyce johnson fighting for the remembrance of uh, november 3rd 1979 the truth and reconciliation project they was doing that dina hayes um skip off and earl jones were doing the museum and you know trying to get that off and open it that up um, but there was you know there was some stuff going on campus you know i was still doing the third thursday lecture series up until like 2004 with student government so that was similar so work in the history club was still going you know you had the million man march in 95 the million family march in 2000 millions more movement in 2005 so there was activism on campus uh, there was a new crop of students that knew nothing about the 90s they in the 2000s and they was growing so I saw a new wave of students, you know, so I stayed connected to the college uh, and I stayed connected to the beloved. And up until probably 2010, I did some projects with the beloved community center, did some stuff with the current organization I with the hip hop caucus. Um, but I was always connected to different things that was going on in the community, whether it was a march, whether it was a little bit organized and just here and there, but it was really not connected to one organization. Uh, until 2012 when I actually uh, started to work with the Hip Hop Caucus. And that's when I went on tour to get people registered to vote in the 2012 election. I actually in 08 helped with the Obama campaign. I wasn't part of it, but I helped. And literally my strategy for that was if nobody was organizing around nothing else, but they organized around Obama, at least after he get elected or whatever happens, I can get all these folks that organized for him to get back into the community to organize for some other stuff. A few people stayed and organized in the community, a few. Um, so yeah, so then, you know, from that, I'm still connected to the beloved community center. We're still connected always to the NAACP, uh, connected to the pulpit forum. Um, so during that period of time, what the pulpit forum was doing, what the NAACP was doing, I always had a connection to those organizations that people already know about. Well, let's talk about the Hip Hop Caucus. What is that and what is your role? 
The Hip Hop Caucus is a national nonprofit organization uh, based out of DC and LA. Um, and our issues um, surround the issue of strengthening our democracy uh, through our Respect My Vote campaign, uh, which utilize uh, artists and culture to get young people involved in the political process and get people registered to vote. We also say that our cultural uh, expression helps to shape our political experience. Um, so we used in 08, uh, T.I. and Keisha Coles with the face of our Respect My Vote campaign in 08. Uh, Reverend Yearwood, our president and founder, actually took Missy Elliott to vote for the first time. Uh, we actually took T.I. to vote in between one trial that he just finished before he went into jail to another one. But during that period of time, he was able to vote, which is very important to us because we want to let returning citizens know their rights to vote. Mm -hmm. So in 2016, no, 2008 was T.I., 2012 was 2 Chains, and 2016 was Charlemagne and God, all at spellings. Uh, and they help, uh, help to get the word out to at returning citizens um, their rights to vote. We also do a lot of work around civil and human rights. So we work with the National Urban League, National Action Network, uh, NAACP, doing a lot of issues around civil rights. Of course, when the whole Trayvon Martin, uh, the Michael Brown, and sequentially, I mean, just, I'm tired of hashtags. But, you know, Trayvon Martin was that, you know, first genocide happened and was involved in that. But, um, when Trayvon Martin, we started a whole coalition of civil rights organizations to, to deal with this. And, you know, it started doing the hashtag Black Lives Matter. And that happened. And then also we're doing a lot of work around climate, around climate change and environmental justice. Um, we know that people of color are getting hit and killed by climate change, but the face of it is not us. It's a Birkenstock white uh, predominantly white male, tree hugger, ice caps, polar bears. You know, you love protecting the extinct animals, but black men are being extinct. Black women are being killed and disrespected, but there's no conversation about that. So when Eric Garner got killed and choked out by you know, the cops in New York, his daughter, which all his children had asthma, his daughter Erica had an asthma attack because of the poor air quality in Staten Island in New York. Um, the air quality of a heart attack, which led to a coma, which led to her death. So when we're looking at, you know, the, the killings on videos of police brutality, we're not looking at the killings from our air quality, from power plants, from landfills, uh, the environmental uh, racism that we suffer under. Uh, Flint still doesn't have clean drinking water. Um, so we're being killed silently by way more numbers than what we see in the police brutality. So we also addressing those issues. And it keeps you traveling quite a bit. What do you feel like you've learned from your travels? You know, moving outside of Greensboro and meeting all of these people. Uh, I can remember specifically you, um, photos of you um, with Native Americans. It had to do with, the, I think, was it the Alaska? Alaska uh, the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline. Yeah. and stay in the rock. Mm -hmm. So what are you learning on your travels? Well, here's the one thing. So going back all the way before um, 95, I was traveling. I'm traveling now with a budget. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say it that way because a lot of us used to roll to national conferences. I remember literally jumping in my car and taking Steve Coakley to New York uh, to do a lecture in New York, I'll be in a lecture in DC, um, the Black Holocaust, um, lectures that used to be at Howard University that students used to go to. Black students used to travel to Black colleges when the speaker would be on their campus. We'll go to St. All, we'll go to Shaw, we'll go to Winston-Salem State. Uh, I remember uh, the History Club going, I think it was either at Chapel Hill, I think it was Chapel Hill, helping them fight when they were starting to get their free um, Black Culture Art Center. Uh, we was there helping students way, way back then. So we have always traveled and we've seen like minds and seen people in the struggle. I connected with Pam Africa over the years with the MOVE organization out of Philadelphia. So I think the travel helps you see the other folks that are doing the same thing, but in different struggles. So I connect nationally, but also connect locally. Um, so, you know, you can be doing national work, but you gotta be grounded somewhere 
locally. You have to be doing some kind of work. It's no use you going all across the world, all across the country helping others, but you're not doing that and tied into what's going on to your own city. Um, but I have learned, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. One, I learned in the nonprofit world is that, you know, a lot of people getting some money to do some work, but we're really not getting money. Our enemy is getting money and a lot of other folks are getting lots and lots of money and not doing anything for our community. A lot of white organizations are getting hundreds of millions of dollars and not, or 50 and $30 million for not doing a lot for our work, for our community. A lot of grassroots organizations are still out there suffering, trying to make ends meet, but they really care about their community. Um, some people got a lot of stories that are not being told, so we're getting able to see different people's stories. So, you know, and connecting the fight of what's going on in Standing Rock. So when you mention Standing Rock, people might say, why are you dealing with Native American? Well, one, we are in their land, uh, stolen land that we was brought here uh, as stolen people. But at the same time, the, the issue is not just Standing Rock, but it's about the path of least resistance because the pipeline wasn't initially going to Standing Rock, it was going through Bismarck, which is not Native land. But when Bismarck said, no, send it through their land, it's like, you're not worth anything. Your native people are not worth anything. Latinos not worth anything. Blacks not worth anything. So we're gonna put the dangerous chemical, we're gonna dump coal ash in your communities. We're gonna put power plants in your community because you're the path of least resistant. So we're connected to them from that. But you know, it's beyond just because of what people are doing, uh, major corporations are doing against us, but we have a history and a legacy. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm seeing all of the national organizations what our leaders are doing, but I'm also seeing up and coming young people that are in the struggle because now we're seeing the rise again. And let me be very clear, the rise again of young people. Because sometimes we say, oh, the Black Lives Matter, all these young people. Well, Black young people in the 90s on these college campuses that were bringing activism. But those young people in the 60s and 70s that was moving the civil rights movement, there were these so all these civil rights giants subtract 50 years from their life and you will see a bunch of young people. Um, so sometimes we get it twisted that we're seeing something new uh, in this day of movement for young people, but it's always been young people in all the movements. So as you travel, um, I mean, you've been to the Women's March, so many different things. Is there one event um, one situation that you've been involved with that stood out to you more so than the others? I mean, obviously I would say the Million Man March, um, but there's many, um, I, I say there's many events. Um, the Million Man March, of course, you know, we organized and I organized um, my, I had, had a car with posters all posted on it going all through the city, putting up posters, having meetings at the Carolina Peacemaker, organizing, and then getting to the Million Man March and not knowing who was coming back and waking up or getting there at two in the morning, working, and then when the sun went up around six in the morning, seeing men from everywhere uh, show up. But not only that was significant, but we had students from Antigo. We had 12 buses to leave from, uh, from Shallow Baptist Church at that time. Uh, Reverend Hedden was the pastor at the time, but after that, he had to change it to Genesis Baptist Church and take a half of the congregation. Um, had a professor named Dr. Matt Lofton that went with uh, philosophy, uh, Professor A.N.T. Uh, and logic, Professor A.N.T. Uh, he was probably in his 70s at the time and stood up with us the whole time at the Million Man March. Uh, so that was very significant in that. But I think, you know, there was a lot more marches after that. Um, I went to the Million Women March in 97. We had the Million Youth March in Atlanta in 98. Uh, the Family March in 2000. You know, I went to the 50th anniversary of Selma, uh, on Bloody Sunny in, in Selma. I went to the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. Um, you know, so I've been to marches all across this state, all across this city, all across this nation. So I don't think there's you know, one particular event because all of them had that significant, all of them had that uh, historical um, um, significance. I, I do know that after 95, I went to the National African American Leadership Summit and I was good friends with Dr. Ben Chavis and Rex Chapman from Fayetteville worked with Ben Chavis. 
um, permitted me and Keith Ryan to go to the leadership conference as guests. And they paid for us to come up there. And I met the minister, Minister Farrakhan, for the first time then. But it was always, but always before me joining and being a part of that, you know, it was all about us as students always making our way to these national organizations to be recognized. And, and there was always certain people that actually supported students like Dr. Ben Chavis or, or Tommy Deutsch of the 100 Black Men. Uh, where we had our national black student government meetings at in Atlanta. Um, so it just is at the point now where, you know, as I watch young people come up, what do they need and trying to support young people in their movement and seeing this, this new blood come up that's emerging naturally or seeing the blood that's coming up through the already established organizations uh, or just seeing the new folks just as on social media trying to put out this good content and good information. Um, but at the same time, battling stuff, misinformation that comes out for folks that are just doing it for show and just doing it for a celebrity, but not really doing it for the people. And I think the best part of traveling is meeting people across the country that are really serious about Black liberation and freedom for all our people that have been in it, from elders uh, to people my age to people who are just coming up in the movement across the country. I want to go back to the Million Man March a little bit um, because of its importance, certainly at the time and um, thinking about the year in which it happened when we were earlier talking about the 90s. Why did that mean so much to you? So what I'm asking really is um, your position as a Black man in an America that's changing and that you are trying to work to change, why does a Million Man March um, mean so much to you even now? A Million Man March uh, mean more to me now um, than ever, but at that time, the reality there had never been a march like that before. No one has ever called a million men to Washington, D.C a place where we were sold as slaves. Um, and it was a day of reconciliation and atonement. Um, so there was a lot of things around that. So preparatory or before that, the minister had been going on a tour, Stop the Killing. So I was traveling with the minister on the East Coast, going to these, these conversations of Stop the Killing. Um, and then there was game summits before that, you know, that was talking about Stop the Killing. So when the minister made that announcement, you know, we're going to have a million man march. You know, we got the word it was going to go and we had to raise money and we had to, you know, organize. As I'm already now fresh, you know, you know, three years now into, you know, 94, three years being quote unquote conscious, this was the first major event that I was a part of. Um, so, you know, I'm getting instructions and then in 95, I'm going back and forth to DC, traveling to the National uh, Phi Beta Sigma headquarters for the Million Man March headquarters and going up there to, to help organize, to organize in DC, to do a phone banking in DC. So I became a part of this big, this big production, but I had no clue of what was really gonna happen. You know, I had no images of what to see about a Million Man March. I never knew what, could be possibly a million man march. So all I knew, the minister called it, we organizing, we strategizing, I was getting instructions, um, but students were organizing and actually a &T was out of school for fall break during the million man march. We was mad about it because we wanted to like demand that they shut school down and send buses, but we was already out of school. <laughs> but, um, but to know on that day, that, like I said, when six o'clock hit, and then Dr. Ben Chase at 10 o'clock said, we have already reached a million men on the mall. I was blessed to be right up where I was actually on the stage. And I actually on the stage, when I look out, I can see literally like the energy hovering over the men. Like I literally could see it as far as my eyes could see. And I couldn't even imagine the picture, you know, we got to see after it was over, the aerial shot, it was like, wow. But I remember seeing men, you couldn't see, uh, and just the love that was in it, just the love. And then when it was over, everybody was gone. And then they started getting the reports that there was no incidents at all. 
in DC. And then knowing that the president Clinton got out of town, Congress got out of town. But at the same time, we didn't know who was coming back. We didn't know if our if we were gonna be alive when we come back. So it was a it was experience to get on that bus. We thought we can go into traffic, but we got there, rolled in DC, okay. But later we learned that the army was there, the military was there, there was underground in the tunnels if anything was happening. Every news reporter, every news camera was there because they didn't know what was going to happen. A million men in one place, they knew something was going to pop off. They knew something was going to be wrong. But the, everybody that came in love and left in love, they had to refund us money for the, the picking up of trash because there was no trash for nobody to pick up after. They had to refund us money for that. We wasn't prepared. People thought we had a lot of money. We did a... Um, we had two separate audit companies or lawyers or companies, uh, accountants to do an audit on the Million Man March. Um, and the nation had to make up the pay because we didn't, people saw them giving all this money, but we didn't prepare for that much money. We didn't prepare enough buckets. We didn't even prepare to receive it. So there was so much money that we didn't get to help to offset the Million Man March. But we did two reports that was published in the final call about what was raised, uh, and no March has ever done an independent audit and published it and given it to the people. Um, women was a part of the march. Women was part of organizing the march. Uh, Betty Shabazz was at the march. Dorothy Height was at the march. Uh, uh, Maya Angela was at the march. So the beauty of the march was monumental. Uh, when the minister went to Africa afterwards, everywhere he went in Africa, everybody, all they said, we saw the Million Man March. The image of Bill Cosby on The Cosby Show, the image of us as students, Black college students on a different world was actually shown throughout the world of us in the Million Man March. And what I mean by that, for us as Black people, we saw a person being a doctor and a wife being a lawyer and students going to a Black HBCU. That was an image that was put in our head to encourage its positivity. But those images weren't going across the world but the Million Man March produced a different image of the black man, a different look. And now we know that we are in a very destructive way. So we need to regather ourselves, come back to ourselves because we've known in the last five, 10 years has been women, not that women have all, not always been at the forefront, but we have just seen them more so due to video and social media that we see the Tamika Mallory, you know, out front, good friend of mine who was, famous and doing the work before the Million Man March. She didn't just pop up and just start doing this work. Um, but all of the women that we see, Melanie Campbell uh, of the Black Women's Roundtable and the, and the work that they're leading, you know, in the forefront of all of this fight. Um, but yeah, at this point, we need to regalvanize and stand up and do a lot more work because uh, our communities need us. Um, and just a small reference you made, you said that you were on the stage at the Million Man March. Which, what role did you play? You, you mentioned a little bit earlier. Oh, but security at that point. Stage? Okay. Yeah, at that point, I was at a little lower level. I was a private soldier at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, by uh, his grace, I'm, you know, doing a little bit more uh, with the, the, the direct services to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. But at that time, I was a, a soldier. Um, just making sure it was security on the stage. And then I got pulled to go to back near the Capitol when the minister was coming in to help form this human wall so he can drive in safely. Uh, and then just being on security on the stage because as I said, it was nearly 2 million men uh, and just to make sure everything was secure. But it was the security out of love because everybody came in love and there was, like I said, there was no confrontation. There was no fighting. Um, but they were there solely for security. And you are called on often to provide that services in various places. So, so I know that's normally where many of us see you <laughs> is in, in that role, right? I mean, yeah, and I'm seeing that way, you know, and it's funny, even when I'm not doing it, I'm doing it um, mm -hmm. when I'm in, in wherever. But I think part of that is for years and still to this day, if I see somebody that is doing something that is, um, if I see somebody of influence, I'm going to make sure that I'm there for security, whether they asked or not. And I end up 
doing it um, regardless of, you know, no one has to call me and say they come into town. Now I'm at a point when people are on a national scene, I may know them or have some connection or the university does call or organizations do call. But for years before that phone call ever came or anybody will offer any financial support, that was just what I did. That was just what I offer. And I still the same way uh, whenever I travel, if it's somebody that I know or somebody I feel that is, you know, of value and all of us are of value, but sometimes we put a, a label um, to certain people of prestige, but we want to make sure that those that are in leadership and fighting for us are secure and protected and honored. Uh, so they just, nobody should just come and put their life on the line for us and just be unsecure, especially knowing the history of how our leadership has been taken out and dealt with. Okay. So in this particular moment, more recently, there have been um, murders of Black men during the summer and during a pandemic. Um, people have taken to the streets. What role have you played in responding to any of these more recent um, murders and events that have been taking place? Um. I mean, a lot of different ways um, because of the hip hop caucus and my relationship with all these national organizations. You know, we are on a bunch of webinars, Zoom calls, having conversations about police brutality, having conversation about uh, defunding police, having conversation about police reform, having conversation about, you know, really following the cases. And sometimes the problem with us in this movement now, we allow our enemy to dictate us, dictate what's going on. And what I mean by that, when a camera leaves, Amal Arbery, we shifted to George Floyd, we shifted to Brianna, we shifted based off where the camera is going on. Cause we still haven't discovered or found out what happened with uh, Amal Arbery. We still haven't finished George Floyd, but we are on Brianna Taylor because she was the sister that nobody was talking about that we needed to make sure. And thankfully uh, the group until, until freedom um, that they're still on a case and they're actually on a bus tour getting people registered to vote. But the reality is like right now, we are in some sense getting desensitized because we're just so used to hashtag, hashtag, who's the next hashtag, who's the next hashtag. My thing is always, you know, in my relationship locally is making sure I work with the police department, particularly the chief of police, that when the protesters are out in the street, that they're safe and they can get home. You know, it is a protest and understand that people are angry, people are upset. We watch people get killed. We ain't used to watch that. But the reality, we did used to watch that. We used to watch that when they used to hang us and they used to have public hanging. They would bring black people to watch the hanging so you can see and rip fear in you. So, you know, folks that are doing the stuff they're doing, they know what they're doing. I think for me, that needs to be a million man march again where brothers can put down their cell phones. I hate hearing a brother at the other end of a phone say, oh my God, yelling about what they're doing to a sister. Like they beating her, they, what, what, why are you videotaping it? Why don't you put the phone down and go rescue your sister? So I hate when we have video cameras and we video and everything, somebody should video it. But every black man shouldn't be around. You shouldn't be videoing. You see all these brothers standing around watching a police beat up a woman, brutalize a woman. At some point we got to stand up. So some people don't believe, you know, I'm not, I'm not the one to say take arms, but there's a lot of people that have taken up arms. Um, at the same time, you know, a lot of people say we need to get into the political office to change legislation, change the political process. Some will even say that the system is set up the way it's designed to set up. Um, they are designed to kill us. They designed to come get us when we out of order. So this is the system designed. And then I may be of the position that we just need to leave and get our own states, get our own territory. You know, we need to get our own states, produce our own food, we're producing it for them. Why can't we do it for ourselves? So there's a lot of different things going on. My, at the immediate, when the protest happened, I want to make sure that my brothers and sisters get home safely. Uh, and I want to be in between the cops and them. I don't want them to be killed. You will see me running straight to the cops and having a conversation. It's like, look, this is what's going to happen to make sure we're taking over a highway, that my people get home safe, that young people know what organized and look like, making sure that they have what they need to be safe, water, directions. But the real thing is not about the protest. 
It's about what are you going to do to strategize after? What are your plans after the march? What are you going to stay committed to? What is your area of expertise? Are you going to be a videographer? Are you going to write down the story? Are you going to tell the narrative? Are you going to sing a song of revolution? Are you going to sing a song that just soothes the souls of the people because they're in so much pain? Are you going to be a healer? Are you going to be a therapist to deal with the mental trauma of living as a black male or black woman in America daily? Are you going to be a health, um, health person to deal with health disparities? So someone who's in education that's going to teach our children proper education and proper history. After you go to the protest, find your role in the movement to better the condition of yourself and your family and your people. Don't come to one protest and say, oh, God, with black power and yell and scream and tear up something and you think you got it out but that's not changing that. Like this year, I made a post. I said, I love it. And I started to post, I love the murals downtown. I, I took a picture by one of the murals. A white lady did it. Do the right thing. I loved it. But I said, I ain't fight all these years of being in this movement, almost 30 years. I ain't fight all these years to have a mural of Black Lives Matter on the street that cars can drive over. That's not what I fought for. That's not what my mentor died for. That's not what our elders stood up for. We didn't fight for a Black Lives Matter mural on the street. Even though I like it, I understand it, but that is a symbol without substance if there's no legitimate changes in our community. There's no economic um, uh, um, growth on the east side of Greensboro. There's no economic development on the east side of Greensboro. If there's an educational gap between our black children and the school systems and it's still going, if they still closing down our school system, if there are still health disparities in the health department and we're still dying from environmental justice, that Black Lives Matter mural on the ground is just that on the ground where we can ride over it because it doesn't matter to the people that are in power. So I'm not fighting for a mural, even though I love them. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here for our freedom, justice, and equality. So you've been doing this work um, at least 25 years, probably a little bit more than that. What do you do when you get tired, assuming that you do, the moments where you just feel like not another hashtag? I haven't found that answer yet. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I haven't. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've suffered burnout a couple of times, but I don't necessarily burn out anymore. I've, I've, I've hit that. Um, I'm trying to find that mm -hmm. because they have become a lifestyle. I have not yet developed a place where I can say, oh, yes, I do this. I, you know, I do this. And like, I, I see my friend Tamika Meyer. I already think about her because I saw one time, a couple of times she have a pictures. She out on the beach and I was like, go ahead, girl, do that. Have fun, enjoy that. Get your whatever you dancing. I don't really care that I don't mind seeing that because I see the other side of her. I see the other side when she's up 24, 36 hours fighting with phone calls, people texting, and she's going this fight, she's going this city, she's going to that city. And people don't see the death threats and the phone calls and the trolling. Um, I just took a picture with Linda Sasor and then security on her gram. And that's, you know, my Facebook page had all these people making comments and threats and threats and threats. She lives like that. And one post she made one time, Linda made, she said, stop letting me know about what they say because I'm getting all their inboxes. I'm getting it all on my social media. I don't need you to remind me of all the stuff I'm already getting. And they got to live under that. So I live under the thought of I'm trying to better those folks that are fighting for us lives as well as those that don't even know that they need their life fought, fought for. Because some of us don't even know that we're in a war. We just going, and some of them don't, some of them know we're in a war, but they ain't got time to stop the fight because they trying to eat and trying to survive. So how can I make their life better? Um, so recently I realized that, you know, I'm, I, you know I, I was like, dang, I had to go to another meeting. Dang, I got to go to this rally. I'm like, why did I choose this life? You know, I was like, Reverend Johnson, why did I meet you? Why did I meet you in earth? How did y'all get me pulled into this to the point that it's a lifestyle? So I'm blessed now to have a job that pays so I can take care of me and my son, but that wasn't always in it. I remember Dina, Dina Hayes used to yell at me and talk about, won't you get a job? Won't you do something? You know, where, what are you, when are you going to get something for you? When are you going to take care of you? When you? But that was like 20 years of somebody saying that, you know, 10, 20 years of somebody telling me that, when are you going to do something for you? 
and I wasn't doing anything for me. So I only got the job with Hip Hop Caucus eight years ago, where there's a consistent income coming around doing the work that I do. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out what is that I like to do for fun, but my whole life has been around this work. I mean, it hasn't been maybe homecoming, but even homecoming I'm working because I'm helping provide the homecoming events for homecoming. Um, so I don't know. I haven't found that, but I, I think, you know, my life is going to be, I'm always working. I'm always in this. It, it has become a part of me. Um, is this moment, this particular um, moment with everything that's been going on with COVID and um, this iteration of Black Lives Matter protests, is this different from what you've seen in the past, other moments where maybe we thought, oh, now this is, this is it. <laughs> There's going to be totally a big different. change here. Is it different? No, it's totally different. It, it's totally mm -hmm. different because we're in a pandemic. I mean, this has never happened. Mm -hmm. um, so last year, people used to say, are you home? And I'm like, stop saying that. What you mean I ain't my home? Because I was always on the road. Um, and I realized that twice a month, maybe like, oh, I was only gone twice a month. But if you don't go nowhere but once a year and I'm going somewhere twice a month, that's a whole lot of travel. So I may be going back in D.C. for this meeting, this meeting, but it was just normal traveling for me. But I was just doing this, doing this. But now COVID, I can't I can't travel. So the first three, four months, I wasn't going anywhere and everything is Zoom, everything's webinar. So how do you organize when you've been on the ground, how do you organize from a webinar? How do you organize from social media? How do you have these major conferences? So trying to shift and, and shifting to do all that virtually has been a challenge. And a lot of major organizations are doing it and we're doing it. But then at the same time, how do you still touch people? How do you still make community? How do you still reach those that may not be on social media? So a lot of us have gotten on the internet but then there's a lot of people that's not on in that. So we still have to remember how to have conversations and go to reach them. And I think this summer was a bigger uh, uprising. Uh, Ferguson lasted a long time. Then Freddie Gray, Baltimore blew up. And, they, and Baltimore, like, we not like Ferguson. You know, they were like, we're a different kind of breed in Baltimore. Um, but I think now the George Floyd hit a global mark. A uh, different kind of global mark than I've seen before. Like there was a conversation all over. I was in um, some country in Asia doing a uh, video conference, uh, talking to Asian uh, youth over there about Black Lives Matter. I was talking to some folks in Brazil about what they was going through in police brutality in Brazil and connected to what we're dealing with. Uh, and the exact thing we're dealing with here, they were dealing with in Brazil. Um, so it had, it's, it's, it's a global conversation that's going on. Um, COVID-19 COVID is a bad thing, but it's a great thing. Whether I mean it's bad that people are dying, but it's good because COVID is exposing our food deserts. COVID is exposing our health disparities. COVID is exposing our educational deficiency. Um, how do you educate, you know, and, and the, the pay wages of parents with children. Parents are realizing what teachers are going through teaching their children because they got to teach your own children at your own home. Uh, how do they supply your children? What are your children getting home, you know, to eat at school? What do you have to eat at home? You know, we are doing virtual at home and some people got to use screensavers or the virtual backgrounds because they don't want to see what people, homes, people are coming from. So COVID has caused an opening, like a 20, this is 2020, uh, an opening uh, uh, to the realities of what's going on. So one of the things to, to help with COVID is to wash your hands 20 seconds. And in Michigan, they was turning off water or not restoring water. So how can you wash your hands? Um, or preconditions, you know, racism is a precondition to COVID-19 and we suffer from so many ailments and bad foods and health and because we have health insurance, or we have even have a job. So we need to get minimum wage or we need to get living wage. So all of the things that we need to survive COVID, we are already suffering from that we are gonna be a case of COVID-19. So this is a, a new time where, you know, 
activism didn't stop going in the streets, um, but it has slowed down the day-to-day -day reality of people and trying to maneuver to make sure that people have what they have, even with this voting election, uh, making sure people, you know, turn into the absentee ballot or going to the polls where you're in COVID-19 waiting in the lines. Um, so it, it's a lot. It's a lot. The question is, how do we come out of 2020 into 2021 and what does that look like? What is the new norm? Uh, and what do we don't want to go back to? And what are we going back to? Um, you know, relieving people of their college debts or their, their you know, financial aid. You could have been done that. So it's, it's so much that we realized that people could have done a long time ago that they're doing now because of COVID, but it was just a decision that people just didn't want to make before. Are we looking at the reality of billionaires making more billions in the pandemic? How is that? And people are going to poverty. It's crazy. So I have two more questions. Um, one related to what you just said. Do you think that people see maybe black men in America, um, people who did not pay attention to you before, um, or maybe it's black people in America. Do you think that we are now seeing that you are now seeing? So seeing maybe yes, recognize no. Okay. What do I mean by that? Um, there's this awakening. Um, everybody and their mama is doing anti-racism training. Everybody and their mama, oh my, every ad, every commercial, every, I'm gonna say something that's real raw and I didn't even know. Somebody came and told me, cause I don't even watch. And that's so why I didn't even know that they had a month of dark skin or black corn, you know, like, because everything, everybody's celebrating black. Okay. They, so, it was something that they was having for free or whatever. And I was like, mm -hmm. even if, I mean, like, so the fact that to the two, I mean, it was just to commercial, to food, to just everybody want to be so black. So what I'm saying they see, so they recognize, so they have to say something, but you, you really don't recognize me. You, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like a man in a relationship and the woman don't feel like you hear him. It's like, I hear you, I hear you. Like, I hear you, but I'm not listening to you because I heard everything you yelled out. Yes, I heard you, but they ain't changing my behavior. I'm not changing anything. So like I said, everybody and mama was doing black, black, black. Like I said, the worst of, even they were trying to get in on it. And that's why I say it's so degenerate. It's like, even y'all trying to just capitalize on Black Lives Matter, really? So it was just like when I just heard that and just everything. I don't even know had dog show black light. I don't know, but so it was the conversation all across. But then it got even deeper when, uh, but I mean, not Trump made his executive order that federal money could not be used in organizations that could not use to do um, to deal with sexism, racism, and stuff of that nature. And I was like, wow, that's deep because so many corporations and jobs wanted to have that conversation and they wanted to do that. So I think it was at a good place where a lot of people that were doing anti-racism work was getting a lot of work and having a lot of conversations and addressing stuff. And it has opened up another conversation I had with some um, philanthropists and some foundations about trying to talk about diversity and talk about different things in, um, uh, in the diverse space of the, the money and where the money goes and who sits in the seats. And so there's a lot of conversation going up in the higher echelons uh, where how uh, money is distributed. But the point is, if the camera turns off and we're not discussing it anymore, who's bringing this to their attention? So in the height of uprising, yes, we're doing all this Black Lives Matter. We in support. We got flags in the yard. We got Black Lives stickers. You got a Black Lives Matter screen or whatever, you know, whatever Black Lives Matter you want, but that fad is gone. So did you really see me? Or did you really recognize me? Because I've been here all along. I've been talking to you. I've been sitting beside you. I've been walking with you. But you really haven't noticed me. 
And even the conversation of uh, white women been out there um, saying they love the black males, uh, reproductive organ, you know, they love that. You know, and been at marches and holding that up. It just, it, it's crazy. But even in the midst of us being seen, our women are still getting disrespected by us and them, which doesn't help us in the struggle for us to be still being killed and we still disrespecting our women and allowing them to be disrespected. Um, so that's also bringing more and more light to that as well. Um, and the weight that the black woman is holding, the weight and stress that she holds in her um, jobs and her academic spaces, uh, how much she can say or can't say, and just the weight that she totes and carries. Um, and mothers. Um, so we say about what we're looking at us, we've always been killed, but we also don't always look at the weight that black women have had to carry um, from slavery to now. Um, so they, it hasn't changed for them. We've been lynched and she was lynched, but she was raped too and disrespected in front of us. And we did nothing or couldn't do nothing. So we should be able to do something now, but we still not. So my last question is, um, you have a son, a teenager, see a teenager now? 16 year old, yep. 16 years old. So when he gets to be your age, what would you want him to know about the work that you've been doing? Well, you know, I already started and I told him and I said, he knows that I love him. That's the main thing. If you don't know nothing else, the first thing I want him to know that a black man, a black father loved his black son. That's all I care. He don't need to know about anything else, but he does know that his father travels all the world to help black people. You know, sometimes he'll see me like, assalamu alaikum black man. You know, he'll, he'll be funny because he knows I'm that conscious brother. Um, so all he needs to know is that his father did work, that his father made time to love him his father made time to be with him and that there's never a time where he can say he didn't hear his father tell him that he loved him. He has always heard his father say how much I love him. And I, that could be something simple, but a lot of black children have not grown up with their fathers and not at least have their fathers say how much they loved them and embrace them. So I just want to leave that generation that he knows how to instill in his children that he loves them and that they are loved and that he provides for them. And he knows that he's being provided for. It's not like it's a secret. He knows that he gets money from me. He knows that he gets money from his mother. That's for me. Um, and I say that that's greater of a uh, what I want him to remember versus me going all across the country and all across the world. Because we can have that legacy and our children can hate us because we never spend any time with them. We never show them love and we never cherish them but we help every other child with our own children. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And you're right. <laughs> the time depends. <laughs>